Welcome to the July 10th performance of the Bellingham Festival of Music. My name is Erica Block. I'm the executive director, and we're so excited to welcome our guest conductor, Ken Lamb, and our guest artist, Conrad Tao. Ken, thanks so much for coming. Erica, I'm delighted to be here, and so looking forward to seeing the orchestra and working with Conrad. Absolutely. Can you tell us a little bit about the Cindy McTee piece, Circuits? That's going to oh, be new wow. for our audience. Well, Cindy um, was born in Tacoma, I believe, and, um, and she's a very well-respected uh, uh, American composer. Um, she lives in St. Louis now, and I first encountered her work during the pandemic, actually, because we had a lot of time on our hands. I was researching on, on living American composers, and she came up, and, and I started going through her website and looking at her work, and... And this work that we're doing, um, called Circuits, was originally, I believe, written for a wind ensemble, wind mm. symphony. And then it was so popular after the premiere that orchestras wanted to play it. So she orchestrated with strings and uh, there are different versions. There's a chamber orchestra version, there's a full orchestra version. And, and she's told me this, that, that this is her, by far her most popular piece. And, um, and I'm always a, a great believer in when we explore a composer that, you know, we, we try and go more than just on the surface. So mm -hmm. I'm really just hoping that this is the beginning of getting to know Cindy's music. But this is the perfect piece to introduce to the Bellingham audience. Mm -hmm. It's about six minutes long. It's a very upbeat concert overture. Mm -hmm. um, it's scored for a, a traditional orchestra, but with three percussionists, mm -hmm. no timpani, three percussion, um, and, uh, and and sometimes with piano, and it's optional. That's what's so great about this, you know, an orchestra of any size almost can play this. And it's got circuits because of this technique that she uses, and she actually really liked using this technique. It's called ostinato, mm -hmm. and which means you have a kind of a, a line that gets repeated. And this line for Cindy, it's a very fast moving eight note. Mm -hmm. And this one gets repeated and repeats. And, and the result is a tremendous amount of energy that's it was created in the bottom register, the cellos, the basses, the low piano. And sometimes the bassoon would join in, you know, just this rumble. And on top of it, she puts in all sorts of different comments and little bursts of energy and 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 it's the whole thing is an almost an unrelenting release of energy mm -hmm. and she also likes the unexpected so sometimes the, you have a strong beat and you know, sometimes you're on the off beat the accents on uh, uh, where you least expect it to be and sometimes there's silences that comes to seem to come out of nowhere and so and she herself has said this she is somebody who She's a composer, she says. She wants to assert something. She wants people to hear her. And this piece almost demands your attention for yes. six minutes. Yes, absolutely. And it just kind of takes off like a rocket yeah. and yeah. sustains the entire time. Yeah, and, 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 and of course for the orchestra, it's six, six minutes. And for me too, it's six minutes of concentration. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. And really interesting licks and kind of the communication between the winds and brass. And it's just... At one point she said bebop style yes. <laughs> and so that's for the the trumpet and, and and the flute i think and and she so she's also influenced by jazz mm -hmm. and she grew up um in listening to music of dance bands and so on and that i think unconsciously just it's in her music absolutely yeah. yeah it's it's an electrifying beginning yeah absolutely and so then we slide into one of oh, the yes. great pieces in the piano concerto repertoire probably one of the most beloved yeah. what's your relationship yeah. with this piece Rachmaninoff and oh, Conrad who doesn't like Rachmaninoff uh, right? the Russians the Russians um they the compo the Russian compo they just know how to write a good tune mm -hmm. Or three, you know, and and uh, it's the most beautiful uh, concerto. I, I think it's something that everybody loves, mm -hmm. 
And uh, now, of course, Rachmaninoff wrote four piano concertos and uh, Paganini Rhapsody. And this is probably the most popular, the second. And, oh gosh, um, where to start? I, I mean, of course, I'll, I mean, you would remember the first time you heard this concerto, Absolutely. right? Absolutely. I don't know, how, how old were you? Uh, probably 14. Yeah, yeah. Baltimore Symphony. It was Baltimore Symphony, it was oh my wonderful. goodness. Was wonderful. Yeah, and, and for me it was something very similar. It was a similar age, teenager, you know, we all had lots of feelings and, mm -hmm. and emotions at the time, and Rachmaninoff just seems to hit all the right spots. Exactly. And, you know, it's, it's, but what I love about this concerto also is it's not just about the tunes. Mm -hmm. If you really go a little deeper and analyze the structure, the and I think I was a few years later, when I think I heard it around about the same age as you. I think I must have been in end of high school, or maybe even in college, when I suddenly realized the relationship between the first and second movement. Mm -hmm. Right? Absolutely. And in some ways, the third movement also, that the very opening of the first movement gets inverted and becomes in a major in the end of the second movement and kind of brings the whole thing completely full circle. Yes. And we understood only when we hear the end of the second movement why the concerto opens. It's one of the few piano concertos that opens with just the piano. Yeah. Now, for the audience, <laughs> I'm going to give you a little question. Can you name three other piano concertos that opens with just the piano. Uh, good yeah, that's a good one. So yeah. Maybe we'll we'll put the answer on the sure. website or something. That's a great idea. Yeah, uh, but it's uh, um, and uh, and of course at the soloist um, can't really ask for a, a better one. Conrad Tao, who I met at first when he was probably twelve years old. Wow. He was one of these prodigies mm -hmm. uh, at the Aspen Music Festival, so he was running around and. And um, and I've done several concertos with him ever since, and it's always very special because Conrad is a very very intelligent thinker, and also very visceral. Mm -hmm. In I, I I hope he doesn't mind me saying this, <laughs> but you really feel that when he plays, every bit of his being is poured into the music. Yes, there's. Everything is authentic, nothing is fake, everything comes from the music, and, um, and we always have a good time together. Um, I think we, we look at music similarly, mm -hmm. um, and uh, I just, when I asked him, I think when we asked him, uh, if he would like to come here, I think he just said, yes, what would you like to, we were thinking about, and he actually suggested Rachman of Second, Wonderful. I think. Because he said, well, you know, this is a, this, when you look at the rest of your program, this would be a, a good concerto for, for, for everyone. Absolutely. And it takes such a unique artist to be able to handle the technical issues that the piece has and sing. And, and not, not get yes. caught and then, up in it all. Absolutely. And you don't realize it's technical. Yeah, exactly. You know, when you don't even realize it's a Until piano. you see it and you're like. <laughs> yeah. And, and so everything is just just singing That's and coming right. out. That's and right. I feel like the best pianists can do that. Absolutely. You never really feel that they're banging on, the, like a percussion instrument, mm -hmm. everything's just sound. Mm -hmm. and, and, uh, and my goodness, I mean, well, you're a clarinetist. So, One of our favorites. Yeah. <laughs> I'm and, looking forward to it. Yeah, the second movement is sublime. It really is. Sublime. And hey, Rachmaninoff was so good at that simple, simple, simple melody that just will break your heart and yeah. so pure. And, and of course, you know, he was very depressed mm -hmm. you know, before he wrote this uh, concerto mm -hmm. because his first symphony was a, not well received and he actually had to, uh, he saw a number of people to try and get better and at the end he saw this uh, neurologist, Dahl, and who managed to cure him from depression. So very touching. This concerto is dedicated to his neurologist. Wow. And uh, and of course the when he played it, it was a just instant tremendous success that just put him at the 
basically made him one of the most recognized uh, composer of the 20th Absolutely. century. Absolutely. I mean, even just the opening, having a piano start by themselves and also crescendo, which they're famous for not being able to crescendo. And here we are getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah. And all, already, you're just yeah. wonder and awe. And then, you know, Rachmaninoff borrowed from Tchaikovsky. Mm -hmm. We have the whole string section playing yes. together. This, this very humble theme. That's right. And whenever I do it, I have to really refrain myself from singing. Yes. <laughs> the orchestra, I remember, I can't remember where I did it, the orchestra after first, um, you know, you, you know, you can hear you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you. <laughs> That's incredible. And so then that slides you into a Russian yeah. family, into oh. Shostakovich. Tell us about your feelings of this symphony compared to his others yeah. and why you chose it to yeah. go along with McTee and Rachmaninoff. One very interesting fact, and I had not appreciated it until I really uh, looked at uh, the dates uh, last week. Rachmaninoff's second piano concerto, 1900. Mm -hmm. Shostakovich, 1945, because the end of the Second World War. Cindy McTee, 45 years later, 1990. Wow. So three pieces, they're all separate by 45 years. That's really Very interesting. incredible. Yeah, so they now, uh, you know, when, when we were going to do this pre concert talk for the audience, I the first person I thought of was Leonard Bernstein. Mm -hmm. And famously, Leonard Bernstein, and you can find it on YouTube, did a talk, a pre concert talk on Shostakovich Symphony Number no. 9. Yes, it's a wonderful. So we, we might as well stop here. Exactly. So just please go play. watch it, it's amazing. <laughs> Okay, nobody does it better than Bernstein. I, I'm not going to try and attempt to outdo Bernstein, but uh, it's it's he, Bernstein has such a um, he met Shostakovich, of course, when he did the Fifth Symphony in Moscow, and Shostakovich went and shook his hand and actually appreciated how Bernstein deviated from Shostakovich markings in the last movement. So he actually said, you know, I actually liked what this young conductor did. He played the, my fourth movement much faster than I indicated. It was actually very, very interesting. Now, the Ninth Symphony, uh, and um, I think it's very, I think it's very good for the orchestra, like the orchestra at Benham Festival of Music, mm -hmm. because we are essentially a sort of classical sized. That's right. You know, we don't have you know, sixteen first violins, and and so and and frankly, the stage is not is yeah. not really for. And it's a 600 seater. So, mm -hmm. so when I was talking to Audrey about picking a program, I was thinking, okay, well, what would work really well with an orchestra with say five stands, four stands, or so, and and yet challenging, mm -hmm. because I looked at the resumes of these players, and they are they major play. players. Yep. I said, well, they you know they they don't want to be playing something that routine or mm -hmm. anything. So this one is, and I asked, okay, when's the last time you did it? Shostakovich symphony. Not very often. I actually thought about Haydn or Shostakovich, but I like Shostakovich a little more edgy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And this one has got incredible parts for pretty much everyone. Yep. Woodwinds definitely, you yes. know, an overdrive yes. like most of the time. But overdrive, but also you know, the clarinet, the second movement, mm -hmm. achingly beautiful. Yes. And now, of course, the third movement is just all yep. really Sparkles. just sparkles. Just, yeah. But the second movement, it's just got all these great clarinet melody, but every few measures, there's a pause. Yes. And, and every pause is, he adds one beat to it, mm -hmm. right? And it's so interesting because as conductors, what I always try to do is you look at notation, music notation, black notes and bar lines and so on. And what the composer hears in his head, he has to somehow force what into he hears <laughs> into the, yeah. these notes, yeah. which oftentimes are just an approximation That's right. of what they actually heard. So our job as artists and musicians and conductors, we look at these notes and say, 
What did he mean by that? Is this rest? How long is this rest? Does it mean for all the quarter notes to sound exactly the same? Or is it something else? Mm -hmm. And so with this piece, understanding the history of Russia, of the Nazi just being defeated, the end of the Second World War, and the authorities expecting Shostakovich to write this victory symphony with chorus and sort of to outdo Beethoven's nine. And yet Shostakovich came up with a classical proportioned, That's right. almost humorous. Mm -hmm. He even put a repeat sign in the first mm -hmm. movement, just like Haydn yep. would have done. Yep. No bells and whistles, just what did he mean? What do you mean by that? Now there's a lot of good humor in the third movement, the fifth movement, the first movement. What about these two second and fourth movements? Yep. Beautiful. What is this bassoon solo doing in the fourth movement? That's right. Because the fourth movement is really just a proclamation with the brass in the most solemn manner. Mm -hmm. Some would say even menacing. Mm -hmm. And then time stands still. The whole string just plays on one note. It's a first inversion chord, which already gives it a little instability. Mm -hmm. But it just, I'm going to ask the players to probably please send some vibrato, mm -hmm. you know, no, just. And then on top of this, the bassoon twice sing this thing, which two, 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 both times different, mm -hmm. but clearly a reference to some of the great ninth symphonies. Yes. The first one, of course, is for, for Beethoven Ninth. Even the first two notes, da, da. Mm -hmm. and in Beethoven's, no, not these tones. Mm -hmm. right? That's though those are the the words. Mm -hmm. And so, what are the tones that are that Shostakovich wants to refuse? Uh, this menacing, marching yeah. proclamation. We want maybe maybe it's about we won the war. Let's rejoice. Shostakovich remember the, the losses that we suffered also, mm -hmm. all the tragedies of war. And then the, we want to call it the brass, come back again, you know, just like, whoa, no, you have to exactly. be happy. We have to, again, one more time. And then something very remarkable happened, which is that the bassoon gives in. Okay. Well, if that's yeah, what I you want. Yep. I'm going to try and see. And then you see the whole orchestra joins in and start this mm -hmm. final movement, which if you just listen to it in isolation, is the happiest thing. Yeah. It's like a circus, you know? Everything is like, oh, you know, chuck, chuck. Yep. And, but in the context of the fourth movement, not so simple. That's right. And that's Shostakovich. In the fifth symphony, now people think, oh, what is that fourth movement really rejoicing about? Are there, you know, in the string quartets, for instance, what is he really trying to say? And you look at his life, the constant fear of being persecuted or arrested, even. And, um, and there, we can talk about, you know, we can talk for a long time about the little quotes of, is that? Does that little piccolo, does it, is it Stalin's voice that right. he's trying to depict? And what is that trombone thing that kept going, ba 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 yeah. ba, ba and That's just wrong, you right. know? And, um, and the, what I find so marvelous about music and so wonderful is these composers, most of the time, if there were a program, there was a program, they didn't write it down. Mm -hmm. So we have to go on overdrive. Right. and fill in with our imagination. That's the beauty of music. You know, Eric, I'm sure you, you, you would appreciate this. Um, historical recordings, mm -hmm. of, you know, just think of a famous clarinetist uh, or violin. Sure. A lot of times, wow, you know, they're so musical yes. in these things. These yes. very old recordings, I mean, you see, like, was crackling and so on. I sometimes think it's precisely because the recording is so imperfect that we have to fill in the blanks. Mm -hmm. And because our imagination actually 
put in all the emotion, that that missed crack perhaps contained. And that's why we think of this. I don't know whether it's you. Wonderful thought, thought, yeah. because that is how you feel. You listen and you're like, oh, those were the days. Those, those were the, yeah, yeah. yeah the, the golden period when, mm -hmm. when you say so much. And I think this is really this very similarly when composers write notes and don't tell you on paper mm -hmm. what they meant. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, Mozart used it to great effect in his opera. That's right. When the sung words mean one thing. But if you really want to hear what the singer felt, That's right. you listen to the music That's underneath, right. right? That's right. So in Shostakovich's case, again, it's these sorts of things. So we infer from his, or perhaps he didn't. Right. Or perhaps it was just, and for him, of course, at the time, it was, it was very important for him not to say. Right. He had to save face and he had to play along. And we only had what he wrote to be able to try and interpret how yeah. he really felt about yeah. everything. So I, I, I hope that um, has given everyone a, 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 some little background Absolutely. of the music. Maybe at the concert, I, I, will, I will talk about it like this, but maybe give everyone a little taste of little bits to listen for. I think that, uh, but if you have time, Please listen to the Leonard Bernstein uh, talk on it, and maybe listen to a uh, just watch a performance online. It, I'm sure you will feel uh, much closer to the music uh, when you when you come to it live. Wonderful! We're so excited. Thank you so much. Thank you. Both.